Okay, so now let's turn to a, a, another broader concept that goes, uh, goes beyond just the case of, of consent for medical treatment, to this idea of reproductive autonomy. Okay, and reproductive autonomy, I think, really undergirds a lot of questions in reproductive ethics. And so it's going to be a recurring concept we'll come back to periodically, including um, potentially in the case of cesarean section and also in the case we'll be about to discuss of abortion. So reproductive autonomy is a species or a, a type of general autonomy. That is, it is a form of self-governance. Uh, it is a way of governing what happens to one's own body. Now, this is variably defined. Reproductive autonomy has different definitions in the literature. It doesn't want no one unified definition. It doesn't exactly have direct um, legal definition, but it's commonly understood as the, pow the power or control over reproductive decision making. Uh, that includes whether, when, and how, and with whom to have children. So it's actually a wide range of reproductive decisions that are covered under the rubric of reproductive autonomy. And like general autonomy, uh, just in some circumstances, uh, general autonomy can be overridden. It may not be absolute, um, uh, including, for example, uh, demand for treatment, just mentioned before. The right to uh, bodily autonomy does not give uh, one a right to demand treatment that is not indicated, for example. So it's not an absolute right in that case. Um, and there are going to be these cases, these circumstances, where substantial debates will occur over trade-offs between promoting or respecting reproductive autonomy and other goods, such as um, pu public health benefits that can be obtained. And so now we're going to be applying this to a particular, uh, a particular very fraught debate uh, over the ethics of abortion. And indeed, um, abortion uh, is an area that does elicit substantial and very deep, um, uh, very passionate uh, disagreement over the limits on reproductive autonomy. And then in this discussion, I just want to highlight, this is an area where there are reasoned and reasonable arguments uh, made on, very, on, on various sides of this debate. And even if one might passionately disagree with the other side, it's important to understand where these are coming from. And there are certain values at play that might be in, in tension and different understandings of values that might under undergird some of the differences we see in the debates over abortion. So let's just consider um, a very straightforward and, and, and oftentimes uh, promoted uh, case against the ethics or ethical uh, conduct of abortion. And so one is to say that reproductive autonomy is self-directed and reproductive autonomy as it supports self-governance cannot give a right to harm others. You can govern yourself, but you don't have a right to hurt other people. Okay? General autonomy doesn't give me a right uh, to assault other people, even if it can prevent others from assaulting me. Okay, and, and those that are opposed to abortion um, will say, well, abortion is just such a harm. It is specifically the killing of a fetus. Uh, and just as um, autonomy in general doesn't give a right to harm or kill other people, um, reproductive autonomy does not give one right to have an abortion, which would result in the death of the fetus. There are a number of rejoinders, of course, a number of replies in the debate uh, in defense of abortion. Uh, one uh, common rejoinder is that the claim that fetuses are not, in fact, people, uh, that they lack uh, a right against being killed. And there are various arguments for why this might be the case. Some argue personhood only emerges after birth, at the point that the fetus enters the world and enters a certain community and relation uh, and has a certain um, uh, in independence from the mother. Remember previously talking about the intertwined interests of the mother and the fetus? You might think only when the fetus is independent of the mother do those rights emerge. Um, others will argue um, that prior to that, that it, they'll, they'll argue that prior to that, the, the fetus's interests are too, um, too indistinct. But there's an alternative uh, line of thinking that says, well, actually, maybe the right or the interest against being killed emerges earlier uh, at some point uh, during fetal development. Uh, perhaps it's a level of certain cognitive capacity. Perhaps it's a level of some, say, ability to feel pain. Um, others would say it's the point of viability, fetal viability, which means the point at which the fetus could uh, survive uh, outside, the fe outside of the womb. That actually, the latter, the viability line, is what is the main factor that has led to the legal cutoffs that we'll return to in Singapore and many other countries in a minute. Okay, but just to note, there's another line of argument in the ethics literature that's just worth considering. Uh, and this is a line of argument uh, from the philosophy literature that says, well, look, even if we, uh, someone uh, concedes that a fetus is a person and has an interest against being killed, uh, it might be the case that reproductive autonomy still trumps and re uh, abortion still may be permissible. And Thompson uses a, a very famous uh, set of thought experiments uh, to try to motivate this, this idea. Analogous cases where uh, we would think, based on intuition, that uh, someone is not required to save the life of another person if doing so requires this very long-term, deep use of one's own body. That's so one of the famous versions of this case. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but if you're interested, you can 
Uh, you can read up um, Judith Jarvis Thompson's Defense of Abortion. And it's the idea, well, if you're kidnapped and hooked up to the body of a very famous violinist by some very fanatical violinist fans, and the doctor comes in and says, sorry, we wouldn't have allowed this if we had known, but look, you're, you're stuck here, and look, if you disconnect, uh, the violinist is going to die. But, and so you have to stay here for another you know, nine months or so, hooked up uh, to this violinist in order to preserve the violinist's life. The violinist's life matters too, so sorry, uh, we can't let you leave. And that would, uh, the intuition is, well, no, 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 that's not right. Uh, the individual would have the right not to save the life of the violinist and to detach. And the argument is that is analogous um, to, uh, to the case of abortion. There's been many debates whether this is really analogous or not, but that is one mode of argument that's used um, uh, to defend the right to an abortion, even if uh, the fetal personhood argument um, is, uh, is conceded. If you're interested in this debate, I'm not going to have to have space or time to go into all of the great nuances. It is a topic where there's been massive literature, massive conversation in the ethics, uh, in the ethics uh, uh, literature on this. Some uh, prominent papers in this area, if you're interested, is Don Marquez's Why Abortion is Immoral, and takes a view that it is a future of value that gives someone a right uh, to a life, and that fetus has that right. Margaret Little uh, complicates the, uh, the, the topic uh, by arguing that we are paying, the debates up until that point in 1999 have paid inattention, uh, insufficient attention uh, to the gestational relationship and that the debate becomes more nuanced when you, when you take that into account. And finally, Elizabeth R. Harmon uh, put forward uh, an argument that the moral status of the fetus is actually contingent on actually the attitude and intention of the mother and that the, the fetal personhood or the fetal rights um, are, actually, uh, are actually dependent upon the attitudes and perspectives and plans actually of the mother. But in Singapore, um, there is some uh, clear law in this area. So if one is wondering uh, in this ethical morass how to proceed, um, the law uh, provides very clear uh, guidance. Uh, in Singapore, abortion under the Termination of Pregnancy Act is legal up until 24 weeks for any purpose, for any reason, uh, medical or non-medical. After 24 weeks, which is, again is, is oftentimes justified or argued to be the point at rough uh, fetal viability, although that's debatable, uh, past that point, uh, abortion in Singapore is only allowed for medical reasons. Now note in Singapore, there's no legally defined age limit or requirement for parental consent uh, for termination of pregnancy, so those below 21 can obtain a termination without parental consent. Uh, there is generally um, a, a counseling requirement for all individuals uh, seeking termination of pregnancy. For those below 16, that counseling um, has to be provided by Health Promotion Board. And there's also a 48 waiting period uh, after the counseling before an abortion can be performed in Singapore. Of course, uh, in, even within the legal context, many who are not persuaded by the ethical arguments in favor of abortion will still object to this practice. Uh, and this is where uh, a, a healthcare practitioner who uh, ethically objects or morally objects or has an objection maybe based on the religious convictions uh, to a uh, form of care, including abortion, uh, might conscientiously refuse to participate in, in, in the provision of that, uh, of that intervention. That is potentially permitted under Singaporean professional standards. So in the SMC Handbook on Medical Ethics, there is um, a series of useful bits of advice on how uh, conscientious, conscientious objections should be handled. Uh, and one, uh, one component is that uh, if a conscientious objection is going to be exercised, it should be explained to the patient, but in a way that is non-judgmental. The doctor or other member of the care team should not be imposing their ethical or moral views on the patient, uh, even if they are obligated to transparently explain why they are not able to provide a certain intervention. Um, this is meant to uh, ensure that uh, this is, uh, uh, the, the patient is not felt pressured by their, uh, by their doctor into uh, not availing themselves of a treatment that is legally permissible in Singapore. Um, it is, of course, uh, uh, quite possible and quite obligated to uh, provide the patient with information about alternative care, but more important is that the patient not be obstructed from getting access to those that could provide the requested treatment, uh, even if the uh, doctor or other healthcare professional does not want to actively support the patient in accessing those services. It's also very important not to give the impression that uh, abortion services are unavailable in Singapore or that no other doctor would be able to, inform, uh, to provide that, as that would not be true. So it is possible to exercise a conscientious objection in Singapore, but care needs to be made that uh, doing so does not obstruct access um, uh, the patient has to legal care in Singapore.